All right, we'll go ahead and begin. Hello, everyone. My name is Wendy Hunter Barker. I am the Assistant Dean here at the School of Global Policy and Strategy at UC San Diego, and I'm pleased to welcome you to today's Global Impacts of COVID-19 webinar series. Uh, as some of you may know, but others may not, GPS has a thriving executive education unit within the school. I thought I'd tell you a little bit about that today. Named the Global Leadership Institute and often called GLI, this unit helps connect people with a wide variety of program types, allowing professionals, researchers, and students from around the world the opportunity to study at UC San Diego. Through GLI, we provide access to more than 80 academic departments and programs across the campus. Additionally, we organize site visits to prominent international industries and influential government agencies in San Diego and beyond that provide exclusive insights into their operations and business practices for our participants. We also have English courses specifically designed to enhance professionals' ability to communicate in a global society. And GLI administers one of the seven degrees we offer here at GPS, our one-year executive master's program, a Master of Advanced Studies in International Affairs. Students in this degree are required to have a minimum of five years of relevant work experience before entering the program. All right, I got that slide in, so we're good to go. Let's go ahead and start today's webinar. It's on COVID-19's impact on health and biomedical research. And leading today's discussion is GPS professor, professor Joshua Graf Ziven. I'm gonna turn off my share screen and turn this over to Josh. Thanks, Josh. Thanks, Wendy. Uh, I'm delighted to be here, part of this wonderful panel on this important topic. Um, let me start by doing some very brief introductions. My name is Josh Graf Ziven. I'm an economist here at GPS. I do a lot of work on biomedical innovation. I've served as a special consultant to the NIH over the years. Uh, I've also worked on regulatory issues many, many years ago when I served on the White House Council of Economic Advisors. Uh, Drew Senier is a physician and serial entrepreneur, served as a managing partner at Enterprise Partners Venture Capital. Um, he, is, he has a longstanding interest in diagnostic testing and has even recently founded a Nonagen LLC, a company developing a novel test for COVID-19 disease management. And we're incredibly fortunate to have Drew on the International Advisory Board here at GPS. Lastly, Gordon McCord is a faculty member here at GPS with expertise in sustainable development. His work is focused on the intersection of development economics, public health, and the environment including some important work that he's been doing for the WHO on health delivery systems and finance in resource poor environments. So let me just say a few words about the structure of our webinar and then we'll quickly jump right into it. Um, each of us is planning to speak for roughly 10 minutes after we're finished with the, the three of us uh, giving our 10 minute um, talk, we'll open it up to questions and answers and we'll, we'll, we'll stay on till, the, till one o'clock, the end of the hour. Uh, the talk is structured in the following, uh, based in part on, on, on the expertise of this panel. Uh, Drew will kick it off talking to us about testing and issues around testing for COVID-19 and COVID-19 immunity. Uh, I will then take over and talk a bit about treatment and where we are in the quest for treatments and vaccines uh, and offer a, lot, a, a few, few observations about some important complementary investments we might make. And then finally, we'll turn it over to Gordon, who will talk a little bit about delivery. So conditional on finding these treatments or these, these viable tests, how do we actually get them to end users, uh, as well as a little bit on social policy to manage this uh, disease it, while, while we're waiting for uh, an effective vaccine. Uh, I just want to start with the following caveat before handing it over to Drew. Uh, as many of you are aware, this is a fast moving area. I feel every day I wake up and I'm drinking out of a fire hose and that I cannot, there are 17 new papers I need to read to understand what's going on. Uh, we are giving you the best, most recent snapshot we can provide at least as of two or three days ago when we all sat down to write our talks. Uh, much of this may be displaced by new information in another week, so take it with a grain of salt. I hope some of it, uh, at, at the very least, is, is, is enduring and, and useful and insightful. And with that, I will uh, hand the microphone to Drew, who's going to start us off by talking about testing. Drew, it's all yours. 
and uh, I'm looking forward to the discussion. Um, I'd like to um, first uh, thank everyone for organizing this. And uh, I'm going to see if I'm Zoom challenged or if I can actually project some slides here. Um, while I'm looking, I just want to say a couple of words that um, I think is, uh, is hard for me to believe, but our knowledge of this virus is less than six months old. And the, and the incredible amount of information that we've already obtained is truly amazing. We've had the world focus on this virus uh, like uh, nothing else in the past that I, I'm aware of. Um, we've also had the good fortune of being in a time when biotechnology and the tools we have there are here to help us uh, untangle the mystery of this virus. And this virus is indeed very different. And I was searching for a name uh, that I could come up with that would um, tell, tell a little bit about at least what I think this virus is. Uh, everyone knows it's a coronavirus, uh, one of uh, three that has emerged recently, but I think it's a crafty virus and it's crafty for lots of different reasons. One is that the symptoms uh, that it produces uh, really are very common symptoms and it makes, makes the dif uh, diagnosis very difficult. Um, you present with a mild cold, or sometimes you don't have a cold at all. And uh, so unless you have some really good tests to figure out whether you have either uh, a, an RSV virus or one of the common coronaviruses, which have circulated for many years, uh, the diagnosis is difficult. The other crafty part of this virus is it's evolved to uh, be able to be infectious and asymptomatic patients. That is, people that don't have any symptoms can actually spread the disease before the symptoms evolve. And then finally, more recently, work out of Los Alamos has shown that the virus is mutating. Uh, we know that there are strains, whether these are strains that actually increase the infectivity or do they alter the clinical course, we don't know yet but it's clear that there is mutation going on in the virus. So I'm glad that, um, that at least we found out about it, but unfortunately um, we are playing from behind. Um, this, this virus uh, originally was thought to uh, have arisen around late December in 20, 2019 in China's Hubei province. Uh, recently, a few, uh, few days ago, there were some case reports that it actually started in mid-November, almost uh, six weeks before uh, be we became aware of it. Um, so this, this means that the virus has really gotten a head start on us and explains, I think, some of the global spread and some of the community spread that's, that's been happening over the last, uh, last uh, uh, several months. So um, I think, you know, to continue with the baseball analogy, uh, we're really in the early innings uh, of what, uh, what COVID-19 pandemic is. And it's kind of running up to score against us. Um, however, I think we have a, a really robust pipeline of tests and therapies, including vaccines that are on deck and hopefully uh, will get us through this. So I'd like just today, given the time to talk about um, some of the tests that are out there. And in general, they can be grouped into three categories. The PCR or viral nucleic acid test that uh, everyone's heard of uh, is one that is only useful for detecting whether a patient has active disease or not. Um, it comes early and then leaves fairly early after the course of disease. And I'll go through some of the time courses in a minute, but it's really 
the best disease, the best test we have for diagnosing the disease specifically. There are other tests that we use to look for nonspecific uh, indication disease, including uh, chest x-rays, CTs, and so forth. But this is a test that really is very specific and, and points to the virus as the cause. Now, the good news is that it is specific. The bad news is that the sampling is very hard. Uh, getting the nasal swabs um, uh, and uh, getting all the virus to, to be part of that nasal swab that you put in the test is, is very difficult. Uh, it's been estimated that 25% of swabs are actually negative due to poor uh, sampling techniques. The second category you see here is just brand new. These are um, direct antigen tests. These are fragments of the virus. Uh, they're very new. The first one was launched, I think, two days ago. Um, they are meant to replace the difficulty of using these uh, PCR tests, but they're very new and their performance is unknown. Uh, today, I'd, I'd really like to mostly focus on the serology or antibody tests. And, and these are the ones that signal whether you've had uh, an immune reaction or not. So I think um, what I'd like to show with this slide is not so much all the details, but to just give you an overview of where the dynamic changes in these markers happen. Um, you can see that they come and they go, and depending on what stage of the disease is you are in, you see the, the line uh, that shows the onset of symptoms. You can have virus two weeks before that, and some of these markers are just coming up, and others are coming up later, but they all play an important role in diagnosis. Um, so importantly, these serology tests have started to attract a lot of uh, media attention. They've been viewed as, as giving us great um, assurance of immunity. Um, and, and unfortunately, even though these tests are antibody tests, and you would think they would mean immunity, um, and people think that measuring high titers should equate to immunity, um, that is not necessarily the case. And what, what is clear is that a positive serology, serology test does not provide proof of immune protection. And there's many reasons for that, but uh, primarily because we don't actually measure the antibodies that are involved uh, directly that provide the protection. The World Health Organization released a statement a couple of, uh, a few days ago where it said that there is no direct proof that uh, there is immunity provided by the test. Um, so why is that such an important question? Well, obviously we'd all like to get pass immunity passports. And this has been talked about in many governments, including our own. Um, this would be actually a physical document that shows you have immune protection. Unfortunately, the tests we have today really cannot guarantee that. And they raise a host of other considerations, including requirements for international collaboration, um, standardized uniform access, uh, social discrimination, and so forth. So we don't have that today, and I don't think we're gonna have that very soon. So the question is, where are we today? Well, we're in a time when we have over 200 companies that have either um, developed or have on the market antibody tests. This is a relatively simple or simpler technology compared to the PCR nucleic acid tests. And it comes in uh, two formats. Uh, one is a laboratory-based one and one is a rapid point of care test. The, the main difference is that the lab test, you can quantitate the titers of antibodies and the point of care test is more of a yes or no answer. Now, understandable that there's been a lot of demand for this, and as a result of it, the FDA became lax 
and uh, the FDA sheriff left town and a bunch of these companies uh, started launching tests. Um, there were drive-through tests uh, in um, LA. There was a, a carpenter in Oregon that built his own test. So the quality of these tests has become very, very suspect. Now, the good news is the FDA sheriff's back in town and the larger companies are developing tests that are much more accurate. Some of the tests that have come out are 99, 98% sensitive and specific, although there's some caveats with that. Um, so where, where do we go from here? Um, we need, yes, we need both quantity, but we also need quality of tests. We need tests that uh, reassure us of immunity. We need to be able to reliably and cost effectively easily scale these tests. And these tests really should indicate protective immunity, otherwise they will not be very valuable. Now the hope is, and that's the elephant that I spoke about in the room before, that just measuring the titles will provide that assurance of immunity. Um, but the ultimate ultimate goal here is to really protect everyone and especially those that are most vulnerable. I think our best chance is to continue to innovate and, and to find new ways to learn about our immune system. So I recently found a, a new innovation that's kind of near to my heart. Um, there's been a mobilization of our canine surveillance corps, uh, University of Pennsylvania and the London School of Hygiene so we now have a non-invasive four-legged screening test. Uh, it has a throughput of 250, million, uh, 250 patients per hour. So everyone is focused on this and everyone is coming to bear on the problem. Um, I think my 10 minutes is rapidly expiring, so I'm going to uh, hand it back to Josh. Thank you. And uh, available for questions later on. Thanks, Drew. Uh, that was wonderful. And I, I hadn't seen the story on the dogs. Um, that dog looks quite like mine. So maybe I can, maybe there's some hope I can, I can train her to, to sniff out virus as well. Um, I want to start by, I'm going to share my screen here for a second. I want to start by, um, by echoing some of the things that, that Drew just said. Let's see if this works here. Okay, here we go. Great. Um, I want to start by echoing some of the things that Drew said. Uh, first, I, I think there's a lot, th these, are, these are dark and difficult times for, to be certain, but I think there, there are lots of positive things to describe from the, at least from the perspective of biomedical innovation. And, and that is, first and foremost, I, I lived in New York City during the SARS outbreak and did some work on the SARS outbreak, and it, it really there's a, there's a strong temptation to generalize to that experience, and, and I think there are some generalizable lessons, but frankly, the state of science looks unrecognizable today relative to that period. The advances we've made in molecular genetics, uh, the advances we've made in IT for tracing purposes, case tracing purposes, there are lots of technological changes that put us in a very different position uh, in tackling this problem. Uh, in addition, I would say unlike the past two pandemic or almost pandemic uh, outbreaks, we really see this, I'm tempted to say Manhattan Project-like focus around the globe. Manhattan Project has pejorative, <laughs> is a bit of a pejorative, but this, this scientific focus that really has led to tremendous efforts across the globe that's led to open source sharing of information that frankly has been unprecedented in my, modern scientific times. Um, we see lots of scientists who didn't work on anything remotely in the vicinity of COVID-related research repurpose their labs and their agendas to focus on the challenge. And I think there's lots of there's lots of positive things to report about that. Although I will I will in a moment flag some potential issues. Um, what I'd like to do now is sort of talk turn to the treatment side of things as opposed to the testing, and I'm going to sort of offer for lack of a better term, a taxonomy that defines these treatments into three broad classes, if I can get my slides to advance. Um, one thing I want to note here for our, our viewers is that the timelines I've put here are 
uh, guesstimates and in some cases wildly ambitious, but I wanted to just kind of give you a sense of the sequence of things here. Um, the first set of treatments that I want us to think about are repurposed existing drugs, right? So we know there are drugs or antivirals on the market or that have been developed for other conditions that may be useful in this fight against COVID-19. Many of you, many of you have probably seen in the news, remdesivir was actually given emergency authorization for treatment uh, just last week. Remdesivir was actually developed to fight Ebola. It was, it, it was not very effective in fighting Ebola, unfortunately. Uh, but one of the wonderful things about these existing drugs and why they're so important in this early stage of the fight is that these existing drugs have gone through trials and have, have need to show two things in those trials. One is that they're safe and the other is that they're efficacious. So in the case of the Ebola drug, we, we, we could demonstrate that the drug was safe even though it was not efficacious against Ebola. And therefore, once we find some hint of effectiveness in COVID, we can rapidly move to deployment because we know that it already has a safe profile, right? Now that, that's good news. Uh, and that, that means there are gonna be a series of treatments. You know, we had chloroquine was hot for a while and now it's not. Uh, that's an anti-malarial drug. Uh, remdesivir looks promising, at least in terms of shortening hospital stays. The evidence on what it does to severity of disease is, is still a little bit ambiguous, but we're in early days. Um, there are other antivirals that may be important. There's some promising uh, HIV drugs that may prove useful, at least in lessening uh, disease severity. I, I want to be clear, while this is important, immensely valuable in this early stage, because these are so-called so shovel-ready treatments, there are still lots of non-trivial things we need to sort out, still lots of things to learn. One is, does it work against this new disease? And then secondarily, what's the right dosing? What's the right sequence of dosing, et cetera? And so there are many things we need to figure out, but if they're effective, uh, they're easy to scale up because we know that they're, we know that they're safe uh, and, and we already know how to produce them. There are obviously production constraints that I won't get into here, but, but they're gonna be an important part of the first stage of this battle. And I've defined them as coming in the next six months. They may, may be later than six months, but we'll see some of these manifest quite immediately. The next phase in this fight is gonna be the development of novel drugs to treat or neutralize COVID-19. Um, these are what you should think of as the usual quest for some new investigational, new, uh, an investigational new drug like the discovery to treat heart disease or to treat any other condition. Uh, the big difference here is that this quest in COVID is really a quest on steroids. While we've always wanted to have new drugs for Alzheimer's, we've always wanted to have new, new drugs for, for, for managing cholesterol. The urgency of this case has really uh, oriented the world around finding new drugs and has motivated the FDA to, to, to begin to streamline its processes to allow these, these drugs to come to market sooner. I, I want to be clear, a normal drug, an average drug, not in COVID times, takes years and billions of dollars to reach market. In fact, the average new drug, new molecular entity, takes 12 years to develop and costs almost a billion dollars before it makes it to market. So we're clearly going to have to compress that time scale. We may be willing to throw that kind of money at this problem. We should be willing to throw that kind of money at this problem. But we're going to have to uh, really greatly suppress the time scale. There's a multitude of, approach, of approaches in play here. Those include novel antivirals, uh, RNA therapies that tinker with cell signaling so that it pro prohibits or inhibits the virus from uh, sending signals to the body to help it replicate. Uh, and monoclonal antibodies that neutralize the virus directly, those are having their moment in the sun and the news. Um, I think they are certainly exciting. Uh, Drew could probably tell us more, but I, the, the only thing I would, I would note here is that we have been looking at mono, monoclonal therapies in a variety of disease areas, and they've had a, a, a very mixed record of success in most of the places we've tried them. So uh, we should, they're having their moment in the sun, but we might want to temper our enthusiasm a little bit. Uh, before before we we go we, we lean all in, so those are those are really therapies designed to treat. And again, I think you know, 
average, average new drug developed in 12 years I've listed, I, I think I put two years here, that's wildly ambitious, but it may be that we see something uh, it, on that order of time magnitude, at least I certainly hope we do. Uh, the last of the, of the therapies uh, in, in the pipeline are, are vaccines. This is clearly the holy grail of what we're after here. These have the potential to fully restore life to normal. Uh, the Gates Foundation has pivoted itself to really singularly be focused on the development of vaccines to fight this disease, and they bring lots of, of both intellectual and financial firepower to that problem. There are a wide range of brand name companies that are engaged in this vaccine search, including names you've all heard of, Sanofi, Moderna, Pfizer, Janssen, a couple of big Chinese uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies, and there will be many more, I'm sure, in the near future. The key thing to keep in mind here, people ask, I, I, I have many conversations about why 18 months, and I, I keep, I, I have to, I have to restrain myself from saying 18 months is wildly ambitious because many people's questions is why 18 months is so long. Testing vaccines is incredibly difficult because the way in which we're going to test these vaccines is we're going to inoculate some patients and have control groups that are not inoculated and then we're going to let time run its course and compare the two groups in terms of the rates in which they get infected. That takes quite a long time and a large sample size to definitively determine the safety and the efficaciousness of these vaccines. And keep in mind that vaccines, in, con in, in, in contrast with the, with the treatments, vaccines are treating people who at the moment are healthy. And we're gonna treat them on a massive scale. So even rare but, but, but fatal or, or significant side effects can really magnify once you, when, when you start to, to roll out a vaccine. So one in 100,000, significant side effect when we roll this vaccine out to the planet is going to lead to 50,000 new injuries or deaths that were caused by the vaccine in a healthy population. So studying this uh, requires time and it requires sample size. There's talk of using challenge trials where we directly infect people with the disease who've been given the vaccine to see how well they fare. Of course, that's a dangerous uh, game, at least ethically, since we know that some subset of those people infected with the disease will develop very severe symptoms and perhaps die. And so if that vaccine is not, is not effective, then um, moving in that direction is difficult. Let me quickly turn to the most recent figure I have on, um, on drug development. This, is, this comes from the Milken Institute. Keep in mind that this is, uh, this is three days old, so it probably actually looks different even today, but you can go to milkeninstitute. I think it's .org and find this chart on their website, uh, along with a bunch of others. The good news is that there's just tremendous amount of action and focus, and that has led to 197 candidate treatments and 111 candidate vaccines as of three days ago. Keep in mind, most of these are in early stages, and the vast majority of them uh, are still working either in, in the laboratory or in animals and are not going to make it uh, graduate onto human trials. Uh, that said, a few of these are already in human trials, and, and, and I, I'd like to be cautiously optimistic that they, they prove successful, at least partly in those human trials, so that we can move them through and into, into clinical practice. Let me use my last few minutes here to talk about complementary investments that we can make while we're waiting for the successes from these biomedical investments to emerge. So while we're waiting for those new vaccines and we're waiting for, um, and we're waiting for those new treatments to come out and lessen the severity of disease, there are at least three important things that we need to be working on. The first I've already alluded to, and that is streamlining the drug approval process. The FDA drug approval process is a very slow, gated, and careful process as it should be. These are, these are urgent times, and so FDA is going to need to revisit its playbook to understand how to trade off urgency and risk in a way that allows us to get treatments out more quickly than we might otherwise in normal times. Doing so, to be clear, is going to mean we're going to go live with treatments and vaccines before all the data are in. And that requires a very robust post-approval monitoring program so that we can identify when things are going wrong or if things are going wrong uh, outside of the laboratory setting. 
Vaccine production is also going to be really important. Vaccine production capabilities are actually quite limited around the globe. Uh, and we're going to need to get to capacity very, very quickly. We, that, that is not a process that happens overnight. So we need to make those investments in capacity now. And the reason why platform investments in capacity are important is we need to make investments in capacity now while still not yet knowing what it is we need to produce. And the subtleties of what you're producing have implications for how you might design your production line. So we need to de design flexible platforms that can emerge to whatever sets of treatments we think are likely to, to uh, come out of this process victorious and effective. Um, the last thing I wanna flag here before, before concluding and turning it over to Gordon is that we're gonna need to think a little bit more carefully about risk and fairness. Uh, risk in particular for producers. So it is very clear that um, if we're going to go live with treatments that have not been vetted over the usual time scale uh, in, in the quest to get something out to, to, to address this urgent problem, um, some, some, some things are going to get broken. Some people are going to get incidentally exposed or hurt by disease, by, by treatments. And providers are not going to enter that game if they face the full legal, um, the legal uh, consequences of that. At the same time, we don't want to exonerate all producers from legal consequences so that they proceed forward willy-nilly or in the, in, in the language of economists uh, without creating excessive moral hazard problems in terms of safety and design. I also want to suggest that when we actually get we, we, as I, I started out this talk talking about this immense global cooperation around the globe in data sharing, in information sharing, in sample sharing, my prediction is that the elbows are going to get sharper when there's money to be made in selling treatments. Uh, this is a global disease. Uh, the, the materials, the science is being globally sourced to address this challenge, and we need to make sure that there is even global access to treatments once they're available. I would argue that designing protocols or agreements to ensure global access is gonna be much easier ex ante now before we have a treatment than ex post once we have a treatment in hand. And so I think it's important for those at the table, whether it's led by the WHO or someone else, to be thinking about those global access agreements in anticipation of treatments rather than after they arrive. So let me conclude on, on one last positive note, and I'm gonna turn it to Gordon. I wanna suggest at some point, I can't predict when, this COVID business will be behind us. And sure, there will be another pandemic sometime in the next century, but the COVID business will be behind us. My own work suggests that directed scientific investments often lead to unintended discoveries. 50% of NIH investments in one disease area lead to important discoveries in other disease areas. Long after this crisis is over, we'll have lots of new medical technologies that can that even if they weren't effective in addressing the COVID problem will generate large and long lived benefits for, for the health of populations around the globe. So let me end there, uh, turn over my, uh, turn the microphone here to Gordon and, uh, and, and uh, I look forward to the Q&A. Awesome, thank you, Josh. Um, in the spirit of saying, what else should we be doing while we're waiting for vaccines and testing and treatment to really come online, get invented and be deployed, let me make some comments on what I think needs to be going on uh, in other realms of the health system to, to get us where we need to be. And a useful way to organize thoughts, I think, is to make a comparison between uh, the Asia Pacific region and the West. Um, and, let the, and the difference is, is truly enormous. And the numbers tell us that. So first, East Asia uh, or the Asia Pacific region has a mortality rate per population, which means just number of people dying per COVID, not out of how many people are sick, but just of the entire population, which therefore captures how many people are getting sick and then how many people are dying subsequently. In China, it's 0 0.33 per 100,000 population. Korea, 0 0.49. Taiwan, 0 0.03. So hold on to those numbers. They're less than one, all of them. Compare that to say France, where it's 38, the UK, it's 44, the US, it's 22, and in Germany, which is the best performing Western country that uh, a lot of the media are portraying, 
it's eight. So even in Germany, the mortality rate per population of COVID-19 is 20 times higher than, uh, than in the East Asia Pacific region. And it's not just China, so it's not about China manipulating its numbers. This is true in Korea, it's true in Taiwan, it's true in Singapore, Hong Kong, it's true in Vietnam, which is a country that's got lower uh, socioeconomic means than others. It's true in Australia and New Zealand that are uh, in many ways more similar to, to the Western world. And so what's, what's the big difference here? I think that that's, that's something that, that should give us a lot of thought and direct our actions moving forward. And it's also worth saying that the economic pain in lots of ways uh, has been less in Asia than in here. So by Google data, for example, the decrease in retail uh, in Asia, in the Asia Pacific region has been 30% over the last few months, while it's 90% uh, in Western Europe and the United States. So you're really talking about almost a different planet between, uh, between what's going on in Asia and what's going on in Western Europe and the United States. And so with that in mind, I think what's, what's, what I'd like to offer is that there's something being lost in a conversation that's just between, we need to lock down uh, uh, or we need to open up the economy. Uh, and that, that binary way of thinking is actually obscuring the fact that there's a massive role to play for a public health system and that that's what really distinguishes uh, the, East, the Asia Pacific region uh, to what's going on here. So for, first, lockdowns have been very effective and all of the data that evaluates the effectiveness of lockdown is saying that these lockdowns have decreased cases by 40 to 60%. So they've been very important in slowing down, um, uh, in slowing down the spread of the disease, but it's not enough. We need to scale up a public health system that does uh, testing and tracing at a scale that we don't do here. So just in testing, for example, this, uh, this past week, San Diego, the county, uh, tested 15,000 people uh, in the last week. If we were testing as much as South Korea tests its population, we would be testing up to 214,000 people per week just in San Diego County before making the decision to go back to work. So 15,000 versus 214,000. What about contact tracing? So contact tracing is you've got personnel uh, who work for the, uh, the health system and when you've got a positive case, this person, these, these people try to figure out who have been in contact with this positive case and, and go and talk to them, test them uh, and keep them in isolation and give them everything they need. So that function of contact tracing um, has a, first a massive role for technology here, which we're reading about in the media and is being deployed uh, in, in, in lots of other countries. There are important questions on the role of, pri or, or, or the importance of privacy with these technologies, but even, even technology aside, the really big difference I would put forward is in having robust personnel. So Wuhan, for example, had 1,800 uh, uh, contact tracing teams of five people each. Uh, at the height of the problem. So that's one uh, contact tracing person per 1,200 population. By that metric, the United States as a whole would need 300,000 staff. As a country, we currently have 2,200 disease investigation specialists doing this, uh, according to the CDC. What about here in San Diego? We've got 120 contact tracers in San Diego, and we've got bipartisan reports that say we need about 1,800. So we need over 10 times uh, the number of contact tracers that we have. All of this goes to say that there's a lot that we can be doing uh, to emulate the success of countries in the Asia Pacific region while we're waiting for uh, testing, uh, treatment, and vaccines uh, to come online. And then as Josh said, we need to think about uh, the rest of the world as well, and particularly the developing world, this is an, if, if what we hope to is get back to uh, a state where there's lots of international travel and lots of international commerce, this is an infectious disease and it's not going to be enough to, to quote unquote solve the problem in the developed world without thinking about the developing world, right? Um, even once we have vaccines and treatments in hand, uh, we're still going to have to figure out how to get it to where the majority of the population lives. Right, so uh, if a successful vaccine is going to attain herd immunity globally, we probably need to inoculate about 60 to 70 percent of the global population. How are we going to do that in, in, in Africa, for example, or in South Asia, uh, or in parts of Latin America where health systems are weak to start with? Which means we need to put front and center from now investments in helping health systems in those places get ready for the arrival of the technologies of testing, tracing, and vaccine deployment. 
We need to figure out what the cold chains and the supply chains are gonna be uh, for PPE, personal protective equipment for those personnel. What are the supply chains gonna be for treatment uh, in, all of these, uh, in all of these situations? And it's gonna be really important that we do that. We've already seen in Ecuador, in Brazil, this is an epidemic that could easily sweep through and kill millions of people quickly. The, the, the media were full of pictures of, of bodies on the streets of Guayaquil in Ecuador. A second wave at the end of this year, the beginning of next year, could be really deadly for uh, a, lot of, a lot of the world. And so we, we, there's a lot that we know how to do in terms of investing in international health systems and investing in frontline workers. Uh, and, and we've got a lot of science behind that, a lot of experience. And it's something that we can do now while we're waiting for uh, testing, treatment, and vaccines to come online. So moving forward, I think just to, just to wrap up, and because I'm also eager to get to the, the, the Q&A sessions, we need to move in general from a, a, a generalized lockdown to a targeted lockdown. General lockdowns where everyone stays home except for only the most essential personnel are very, very economically inefficient. Because if you're a, a, a person who's healthy and a person who's low risk, uh, it's very inefficient for the economy and very costly for you to be staying home. We should be isolating only those who are infected or only those who are likely infected. But the only way to do that is to have massive testing and contact tracing going on in society as we've seen uh, in the Asia Pacific region. We need health workers whose job it is to, uh, the moment somebody gets diagnosed, figure out who does that person, who has that person come in contact with over the last week or two, interview those contacts, go to their homes, conduct tests, explain that they should stay in isolation while they weigh the, te the, the testing results then we should have wraparound services for those people who are isolated. We should have full sick pay uh, for people who, uh, who are in isolation that's contingent on, for example, what's done elsewhere, texting your temperature reading every six hours, uh, confirming that you're actually self-isolating, agreeing to community health worker visits while you're in isolation. But then there's, if you're receiving a full sick pay, you're not having to make this impossible choice of, I need to feed my family, so I need to go to work. And even if I'm sick or I don't feel well, I, I, I can't make the choice to not pay, feed my family. Wraparound services should include also an emergency call-in number for people who are in isolation. Websites for food deliveries for those people. Uh, the community health workers could be offering these individuals face masks, a thermometer if they don't have one. So you can imagine an entire system that's built around contact tracing and then offering support services for the isolated. That way we, we do very targeted isolation instead of having to do this very inefficient generalized lockdown. Then the developed world needs to do more to support the international system. Uh, it, it is the job of the international system to help that, um, to make sure that health workers all over the world have access to PPE, that health systems have access to ventilators. The WHO has the mandate of offering guidance and securing supply chains for the developing world. The International Monetary Fund should be offering emergency financing with minimal conditions to try to keep things afloat just for the next few weeks and months once we get these, these systems up in place. But often what we're seeing, and we're certainly seeing it in this country, we're turning our back uh, and blaming that international system instead of understanding that investing in it is what we need um, uh, to actually solve this problem globally. And then the last thought I'll give is we actually have a tremendous political and fiscal opportunity uh, to really make large scale social protection investments. And this really wasn't possible before COVID. There are massive fiscal packages on the table across the world. We understand that the recovery is going to be investment-led. It's not going to be a consumption-led recovery. And so the government need to, needs to think about where are we going to do important investments. And investing in the health system hits two birds with one stone. It's the sector that needs help. It's the origins of the crisis. Uh, but also, and this is especially true in the developing world, if you're hiring hundreds of thousands of contract tracers, you're generating employment demand that's going to replace some of the lost jobs um, around uh, in other parts of the economy. And uh, just to emphasize, there's a lot of work that's gone on, to the, on this. So I've written uh, an, a costing study, for example, on the sustainable development goals and carefully thought about how much would have to be invested internationally to get functional primary healthcare systems that could do things like contact tracing and community health workers in low-income countries. And we're talking about imminently affordable amounts of money compared to what's on the table right now. They, on the order of 0.4% 
uh, of gross world product per year, less than 1%, small amounts of money compared to what we're talking about in the United States or in Western Europe, would go a long way to getting these primary healthcare systems on the ground, online, and ready for testing, tracing, vaccines, and treatment once all of those technologies are online and ready to go. Let me stop there and I look forward to the questions. Thanks, Gordon. Um, we have a we have a great set of questions and not a ton of time, so let me let me let me jump right into it. Uh, I'm going to start with the first question here that relates to the anti-vaccination movement. Uh, the question is essentially: there are rumors and conspiracy theories swirling on social media related to vaccines. This is a disturbing development. What are your thoughts on how to counter a the effect of this negative campaign, which is ca causing people to say, I won't give my child a vaccine or I won't get a vaccine. Um, I, I will jump in first and quickly, uh, and then the two of you can jump in if, if you'd like, or we can keep moving along. Um, the one thing I would say here is that there is some interesting evidence, um, not obviously in the context of COVID, there is, there is lots of interesting evidence that suggests at least a large faction of the anti-vaxxers are living in a world in which the threat from the thing they're vaccinating against is very low. So economists refer to this as prevalence elastic demand. So when the risk is really high, people want vaccines. When the risk is really low, people say, well, I don't know, is the science really good? Should I do it, et cetera. And for those reasons, we see you know, vac vaccination rates in certain Tony zip codes in Los Angeles look worse than in the worst parts of Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, it's a tremendous luxury to be able to not vaccinate your child against a horribly debilitating disease, and that luxury is afforded by, by the fact that so many others are vaccinated. My profound suspicion in the context of COVID is if we get an effective vaccine, the number or size of the communities that are against vaccinating are gonna look much smaller given the, the, the very imminent threat of this disease relative to those diseases for which we've been vaccinating for such a long time that the background risk is low. Uh, Gordon, Drew, do you wanna add anything to that? Okay, I, I see head shaking now, so let's, let's keep going. Um, I've got a, a, a couple here that are politics related. Gordon, I'm gonna put you on the spot for this one. Uh, the WHO has been exposed to harsh criticism from, from, from our point of view. Uh, do we think the WHO is impartial or susceptible to, to politics or both? I, I think that's, I mean, it's a good question. Obviously the, the, the entire UN system is, is made and um, run by its member states. Uh, and so all, all of these large countries that have large stakes in financing these international agencies have an important voice to play uh, in how the agencies operate. And to that extent, there's, uh, there's some to and fro that happens if these countries have agendas. And so uh, certainly that the, uh, both China and the United States sit at the, the you know, running bodies of the WHO and if what we see right now, the United States has a very strong agenda against uh, China on this, there, there's a lot of politicization that happens. But the agencies are comprised by thousands of professionals who are deeply not political. They're scientists, they're trying to further global public health. Um, they're not privy to what's going on at these upper echelons and, and, and we should trust the science that comes out of these, of these experts. That's my own, uh, that's my own personal view. Um, and, and what I'm seeing more of is, is just that as the years go on, instead of investing in these institutions as, as a country, we, the United States, who created this system, seems to be actively uh, interested in undermining it. And, and I don't think that helps anyone. Yeah, I, I would just say the, um, if you go to the WHO website, you'll see a timeline for how this uh, virus was handled by the organization. So in, um, it was first reported in December 31 of 2019 uh, by the Municipal Health uh, Commission of, uh, of uh, Wuhan and, and Hubei province. And it was not until March 11th that uh, WHO declared a pandemic officially. Now there's a lot of um, in between steps that occurred, but they were taking it with, as Gordon was saying, with a lot of scientific rigor to make sure that they were not overly stating or understating the threat. Could it have been faster? Absolutely. And I think that's one of the questions that will need to be addressed when 
if we go back and look in the retroscope. Great. Um, I'm going to bundle two here that are not exactly the same, but are at least close close enough so that we can try to try to answer as many as we can. Um, we've got a question here uh, about whether there's any precedent for creating a new vaccine successfully in such a short time. If not, what gives us confidence in vaccine development? And and a separate question, which is if the virus keeps mutating, uh, should we think that the vaccines will be useless or difficult to to construct? Um, Drew, do you want to? Go first and I can I can pile on. <laughs> sure. I I don't know of any example, maybe someone does, of warp speed vaccine development. It's sort of a uh, oxymoron a little bit because of some of the things that Josh was saying. Uh, there is, I believe, a push to begin to think about challenge trials. And these are where you take a uh, hundred healthy uh, young people, put them in a hotel, uh, give them the vaccine, and half of them, you give them the virus and see what happens. Uh, I think that ha helps on efficacy. It certainly doesn't help on safety. And the problem with safety is that these adverse events are often very rare. Uh, and until you treat 10,000 or 100,000 people, you can't pick up these really rare adverse events. Um, so, the, I'm sorry, I forgot the second part of the question. About mutation. Oh, um, so there are mutations that have been reported. Um, and the question is, what do they mean in two respects? One is that increasing the infectiousness of the viral particle or decreasing it has to do with how the virus attaches to the cells. And then second, if that happens, what does that mean clinically? Will the virus be processed by the body differently than, than it was? Even though it might be more infectious, um, is it handled the same way? Is the immune response the same? Is the inflammation the same? The evidence so far is that there is mutation, that there may be more infectious particles, but we don't have any data on clinical outcome. And right now, it doesn't look like it's segregating along those lines. Thanks, Drew. And I, I would just only add on to this, I, I agree that I, I cannot think of a single precedent in which a vaccine was created from whole cloth rapidly. Mm -hmm. uh, the only uh, footnote I would add to that is um, if we got really effective treatment so that we couldn't stop the spread of disease, but we could make this disease very, very humdrum and its impacts, uh, that would also be immensely powerful, both for, for health reasons and for economic reasons. Um, and we do have precedents for developing drugs much more rapidly. Even the Ebola treatments we have now came, emerged much more rapidly than, than, than many of the other treatments that came before it. And so there is some hope that we may make some progress on there. Uh, but 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 only time will tell. Um, let me let me quickly. I want to I want to try to get squeeze in two two more questions at least. Uh, we got five minutes. So there's a question here on vaccine manufacturing sites. What's needed or preferred? Would ma manufacturing binationally between the U.S. and Mexico be a good idea? I'm gonna, just going to quickly jump in on that. If anyone wants to add, that's great. Uh, the only thing I would say is uh, about manufacturing that's important is to not narrowly think about manufacturing as simply being about manufacturing the active ingredient. Clearly being able to manufacture the active ingredient is important. It requires highly sterile conditions. Those are very specialized facilities. And in some sense, it will depend on what this vaccine looks like, whether it's an activated disease, whether it's recombinant, well, that will determine in part what that manufacturing process looks like. So, so it's going to be hard to think about, A, they're costly, large, sterile facilities, and in this case, they're going to have to be a little bit uh, partially developed until we know what we're making. At the same time, there's all, all the adjuvant things needed to deliver those vaccines also have to be made. We need to make 5 billion syringes, 5 billion... Uh, dosing containers that can survive transport through resource limited environments. All of those are things that, that are not wildly technologically sophisticated. We know how to do those things, but we, we need to be able to produce them at a scale that, that is unprecedented. And there's, so there's lots of room 
to, to broaden the supply chain, as it were, in thinking about rolling out new vaccine technologies when they're available. I see nodding from Gordon and Drew. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to, I'm gonna have us end on uh, this question here. Uh, we've got a question, which I don't know any of us are, are wildly prepared to answer, but I think it's an important one. And that is uh, the present diagnostic of the situation where, where we've laid out here is clear and what to do is more or less clear. What is missing in the discourse is who, how, uh, who and how is this gonna get done? And that's a political conversation. So how do we think about the politics of tackling this problem in a way that's efficient and, and oriented towards the challenge at hand? Um, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll just quickly lead off and then step away. The one thing that I, I think is, is interesting and I think we're starting to see some news coverage on this is um, you know, much of the politics here is this pull push tension between protecting health and vis-a-vis uh, -vis the disease and protecting health, as it were, vis-a-vis -vis the economy. Um, and one thing that we're seeing around the globe is that just because you tell people they don't have to shelter in place doesn't mean they spend lots of money in investment in restaurants. And so if it turns out that relaxing social distancing doesn't lead to massive upticks in the economy, that will relieve some of the political pressure to engage in those activities until we're ready. That doesn't solve the how do we get how do we get the new treatment problem and how do we disseminate the new treatment problem. But it, I think it's I think we're going to learn an awful lot in the next two to four weeks, particularly in the U.S., where we're running 50 mini experiments where every state is doing its own thing. We're going to learn the states that are relaxing early. We're going to learn. A, how much it affects the economy in those regions, and B, how much it affects the resurgence in infections. And that's going to change the calculations for many other places as they move forward. So let me turn it over to Drew and Gordon. So um, we have a very much a patchy approach to this. And just to talk about opening back up, for example, we don't have a real taxonomy for what opening back up means. Uh, there's Clearly, none of the states are following the federal phase two guidelines that I'm aware of. Um, and the concern I have is we're doing these experiments, but some of these experiments have already well underway. There was talk of the Swedish model, and that was very little restriction, life normal, economics normal. But now I think they're paying for it. Um, they now have... Uh, 291 deaths per million population, which is number 10 in the world, and it's rising faster than any country. So that experiment of, uh, of laissez-faire on this is not worked. Uh, what will be important, I think, are some of the uh, local lessons that we can take from other countries that are form forming regional bubbles. For example, Australia and New Zealand are working together for, for travel and how to document people going back and forth. So this is gonna be complicated. We, we have uh, 50 sovereigns here in the, in the United States. Everyone will be doing it differently and hopefully we will be learning and, and learning these lessons, not from here only, but from abroad also. And I'll just add one thing and I know this is our last minute, but. But as I said uh, when I was speaking, I think this is a moment of political space. I, I think there's, um, there's something like near unanimity probably in that in investing in a public health system well articulated by the leadership is a good idea. There's a lot of public sector money on the table as part of economic recovery. A lot of those would go to creating new jobs in the health sector. Uh, so you could imagine that if we had a leadership, whether at state level, uh, where we have 50 ways to try it out, or at national level, that if we were to articulate, look, it's not between locking down or the economy. In fact, that's a false dichotomy. We need to do both. If we invest in public health systems, that's going to help create a bunch of new jobs. It's going to prevent us from having to go in this lockdown open cycle, which is probably what we're going to be doing for the next year. And if we were investing in actually having sentinel surveillance, contact tracing, lots of stuff going on, uh, I think both sides of the political aisle would see a path forward that makes sense instead of the yo-yo that we're on now. Great. 
Um, I'm going to end on yo-yo here. I want to thank my, my co-panelists. This was a, a, a stimulating conversation. I want to thank the participants and th those of you who, who asked probing questions and those of you who just joined us um, silently. We appreciate uh, your participation and we look forward to seeing all of you in person uh, soon, but not too soon. So uh, thank you very much.